Welcome everybody to today's session. I think everybody is slowly being let into the group. Can everybody hear me okay? Thumbs up? All right, <laughs> fantastic. I've had some tech problems today, which is always fun when you work in tech and have multiple laptops and other items at your disposal. But anyway, pleasure to have all of you join us. My name is Jenna Seiden, and I am very fortunate to be moderating today's panel with three distinguished gentlemen who each represent um, sports and technology. They're working at the intersection of sports and tech. What's fascinating about their pioneering solutions is that they are not only looking at the professional uh, athlete, but they're also looking at how their solutions can work with broadcasters, with leagues, with teams themselves, and importantly, just as importantly, looking at the end user, the fan. Um, whether they connect to the fan through those channels of the broadcaster or teams or they have a direct connection to them So we are going to hear from three gentlemen as I mentioned we will hear from uh, Constantine and I'm gonna do my best at pronouncing his last name Detala, I apologize. Uh, he's with Beyond Sports uh, Jeff Nyquist from uh, Neurotrainer and Dylan Shaw from YUR full disclosure. I'm a consultant for YUR so just letting everybody know that. Um, my name again is Jenna Seiden, and so that you know who I am. I am a consultant in the emerging technology space. I currently work with a company based in Eindhoven. I work with Lumo Labs. They are a two-year venture building program and a fund. They invest in startups who focus on emerging technologies, specifically looking at those who support three of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals smart cities, uh, health and well-being, and education, quality education. I also consult with a lot of the development teams in VR, some more, more on the consumer side of things. If some of you have heard of Beat Saber, I work with some narrative interactive storytellers. I consult for Oculus, which is ironic because I started off working for HTC. But my background uh, also includes starting off in sports. I, I learned everything from the wonderful tutelage of David Stern, uh, former commissioner of the NBA. So I started off in professional sports and then I went into video games and please don't hold it against me. I am a recovering Hollywood talent agent. And so I've, I've worked in the crazy industry of, of Hollywood, but I went tech and I work in video games and was very fortunate to work on a lot of sports franchises and work with a lot of fitness interactive uh, platforms, which is hopefully helpful in scoping the space for everybody. So what I plan to do is give you a very brief context of the VR market and some of the topics that I would encourage all of you to consider as you hear from Constantine, Jeff, and Dylan today, because it's very important to look at where they started in a pre-COVID world and where they are today in this COVID upside down world where we are, and then is anyone's guess where we go in the future. These companies have wonderful solutions that stood on their own prior to COVID. They focus on performance and professional uh, enhancing optimization uh, of athletes' performance, but they, also are looking at you know how they complement the current sports ecosystem but where we are today is are they going to fill the void are they now going to become the replacement for where we are since leagues have postponed or shut down or it's a whole new way for fans to engage since of course fans can't go to events so it's important to look at each of these companies from their professional b2b business and their b2c because I'm assuming everybody here who's joining us today is going to use that information to inform the types of partnerships that they are looking for or how to amplify current partnerships that they are looking to do. So let's look at it from as we go into these discussions from a training perspective, from the fan immersion perspective, and then again, how we apply those two partnerships that we're going to go into. So let's just briefly start with um, the athlete themselves. What solutions, what products and services do each of these three companies represent that can really help athletes, teams with both physical performance 
and mental performance. And we're going to hear about some very interesting um, visualization, uh, AI-based visualizations that uh, Beyond Sports does. We're going to hear specifically about a lot of the neuroscience behind uh, NeuroTrainer and that mental well-being. And from Dylan, as he talks about some of those biometrics, what are those traditional and what is the future of biometrics uh, from these gentlemen. But really, we're thinking about on the training side, every inch matters uh, to an athlete. Every second matters to an athlete. So how can these tools help them with their performance, with decision making, with their acuity and focus? Um, I personally have had my eyesight improved using virtual reality. My peripheral vision, I'm, I'm blind in my left eye and my eye doctor has actually seen my visual acuity improve. So can't wait to see uh, and learn more literally see, uh, and learn more from, from Jeff how they can help with uh, some of those uh, data points. So let's look at it from enhancing performance. Let's also look at what they say from data. What data are they all collecting that will help an athlete individually? What data are these tools and solutions providing such that they can inform a league, inform a broadcaster about the audience as well? Um, and personal fitness as well. So let's look at the, those elements. Um, and then let's look at it from the fan perspective. We're talking about VR simulations. What is it that a fan's going to care about because they can't go to a live event? What are those social features that represent um, that camaraderie, that community that we need to think about? So I think it's very important that we look at those VR simulations uh, from the fan perspective, um, but also going back to the athlete a little bit, something that I think the gentleman will touch upon is, especially with Beyond Sports, when an athlete is training now by themselves at home, what is the difference between uh, improving your performance and training in a room, in your living room, uh, versus going into a gym? if they can go into a simulated environment, it's not only being able to use it from a virtual playbook perspective and seeing how they can you know, apply a, a certain play, but also what are those distractions? What is about the noise? Can they simulate everything that's gonna be happening, especially when the Olympics are, are involved? You've got fans, noise, sponsors, media. There are a lot of things that need to be simulated. So again, from the training, athlete side to the fan side, we have a lot of inputs and variables that everybody here needs to, to approach. So what I'd like to do now, if Melena will help me since uh, my computer's not working wonderfully, is do a quick Marketplace 101. If we can just go to the first slide, if you wouldn't mind, that's sort of the last one. Wonderful. So just to scope everything for everybody, you can go to that next slide. When we're talking about virtual reality and all these gentlemen are gonna be Focusing on VR, but they also integrate AI, AR, other technology to create their products and services. I just wanted to share and give you guys a perspective as to the hardware market because, um, as you'll hear, these creators are ahead of the curve. Uh, the hardware market is not only not ready, it's not mass adopted, but also the feature set that these gentlemen and the women on their teams are creating. Um, is well advanced than where the hardware is. So just to, as a quick marketplace swath for you, we have headsets that were originally based on being connected to the PC. Those are PC VR, as I'll reference. Those are very more on the expensive side, side of things. You have to be tethered to a high-powered laptop or a PC. And if you look at this chart briefly, uh, PlayStation, they have 108 million PlayStation 4s out there. Therefore, they have 5 million headsets sold. They are the most approachable, but you have to already have a PlayStation. They're, they represent one end of the market. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have these standalone headsets, which are much more accessible, um, where you don't need to be tethered to anything. That's the future. And so it'll also be interesting to hear from uh, the panelists as to how they are developing and how they will you know, get these headsets into the hands of the athletes and the consumers because there are friction points as to the technology and as to the um, just availability and the, you know, ability to move. So if you can go to the next slide, this is just a visualization at one end of the spectrum. You can see there are many headsets out there, but the HTC Vive, Valve Index, PSVR, and the Oculus Rift S 
these are the highest end of the spectrum, but they require wires and external cameras to allow you to feel very immersed. Then as you go down the spectrum to your left, uh, you'll see the Oculus Quest and the Pico Neo. Those are tetherless, and that's where I think the industry is going. Um, and, and especially for the masses, it'll be interesting to see, especially Dylan can speak to um, expectations on hitting the consumer market with the Quest. And then last slide, if you wouldn't mind going to it. Uh, I don't know, will this video run? Um, I just wanted everyone to understand what we're talking about here in terms of immersion. Um, if you want to play the video, does it work? Let's see if it works. Okay, it's not working. <laughs> it's probably from a PDF. Uh, we're talking about six degrees of freedom. Um, I, I, I think that everyone's going to be referring to um, what VR allows you to do is have not only the simulated environment, but rotational, which means moving your head side to side, up and down, but also the ability to move back and forth, orientational tracking and move forward and back in your environment without the fixed objects um, moving with you. So we're gonna talk about six degrees of freedom and I wish the video were working. Anyway, um, with, with all that said, um, Lenny, you can just go back. Um, I think we should go to our first presenter. I believe Constantine is going first, if I'm, if I'm correct. And I'd like to welcome Constantine from Beyond Sports to share with us his AI-based visualization company, Beyond Sports. Brilliant. Let me quickly just share my screen and then that should be it. I hope this is visible. Brilliant. Um, cool. Um, so yeah, Beyond Sports, um, maybe just before we start, a couple of words about me, if my slides let me. Here we go. Um, I'm actually still quite new to sports tech. Um, I've only been in sports tech for about two and a half years. Um, before that, I, I come from the advertising tech side, um, which is still tech, but kind of a different tech, but applicable to sports tech in the future when it comes to more of the monetization uh, uh, themes. Uh, I've been kind of a globetrotter. I've moved 18 times in my life. I hope that next month will be the 19th and final one here in Altmar, so that's, um, that's the plan. But I've actually lived in San Francisco for, um, for four years, from 2014 to 2018. Um, probably that picture, um, yeah, um, it rings some bells. And then, um, uh, yeah, I should have actually, and that's kind of the, the switch over to, to virtual, uh, virtual sporting, I, I should have done the eighth life cycle, which would have taken place this year from SF to LA but didn't because of, of, of COVID. And, and then I chose to, to start Zwifting, which is a, uh, yeah, a virtual cycling company um, based actually out of California and became uh, yeah, a Zwifter, joined a the team there, joined kind of made me, made me realize that I, I was missing the old gaming days. They actually called themselves a, a, a sports game or it's an eSport. Um, and they're actually doing at the moment, they've seen some huge growth and they're actually doing um, currently the, the virtual Tour de France which is great to see. And um, so kind of that, that's the switch over to, to the virtual side. And I joined Beyond Sports um, earlier this year. Um, so what is Beyond Sports and where kind of did it start? Uh, I'm not sure if you know who the gentleman in those glasses is. Most of you guys will probably re uh, yeah, recognize him. That's uh, Luis van Gaal. Uh, he kind of spearheaded uh, the idea behind Beyond Sports, I think seven years ago when he was in a, in a room that thankfully also our two co-founders, Nico and Sander, were in and was wearing the VR headset for the first time, doing, I think, this roller coaster experience and said, this is amazing. Um, I want something like this for my players. Um, so how can we do this? Um, and then both Sander and Nico said, we'll have a, a prototype on your desk within two or three weeks, uh, which they did. And this kind of, this is how it started. Um, so what are we actually, what are we doing? Um, uh, you know, beyond sports, we're kind of, um, you know, we're, we're in, the, in the business or we're specializing in the analyzation and the visualization of positional tracking data in the, in the context of team sports. Um, what does that actually mean? Could mean a lot. Uh, so I, I prefer to show you guys uh, what we're doing. It uh, means we're looking at uh, this kind of stuff on a daily basis. Those are dots, those are coordinates that we take from uh, positional tracking cameras that are on football or um, hockey pitches um, that, that obviously have that infrastructure. And those represent specific dots and objects on a field. Um, we only get those dots, we don't get anything else. And out of those dots that we look at frame by frame during the game, we're actually able to recreate um, a 3D simulation, kind of a virtual, uh, virtual field that we can navigate into in order to create and recreate different angles um, that normal cameras are not able to get to, such as this. 
even to the player's head or to the goalie to be able to be able to see their, their point of view. Um, and we do this in a fraction of a second. So this is basically live. Um, so you can actually go through these moments and, and even live stream them if you want to. And we've done some of those things and I'll, I'll show that to you guys. And the funny thing about this specific angle is that it was um, a recent game in the Premier League um, and the referee made a, a crucial decision during that scene. Um, and he was then confronted uh, in the post-match analysis by this point of view from the goalkeeper. Um, and so the ensuing conversation was actually quite interesting. Um, maybe you guys will, will see it somewhere on YouTube. Uh, discussing it right now, it, it goes into VAR and all these kind of beautiful things, but um, it's actually a good conversation starter as well and, and gives new perspectives in broadcasting. Um, so where does this kind of technology make sense? I and mean, then we've kind of spoken about um, yeah, two, two main areas. One is a player, let's say more B2B focused um, when it goes to the, the clubs and the leagues and, and the, the, the data tracking providers. And then the other one, which is the lower two points here, is a bit more related to fan engagement and new ways of consuming, of consuming the content. Um, so how do we go about um, working with players and play performance and also match analysis in the context of, of VR? Um, this is kind of uh, what, we, what we work with. This is the, the concepts and the, the products um, that uh, Luis Manjal kind of had in mind. And this is what we do together with um, Azit Alkmaar, uh, with um, Ajax Amsterdam. We also work with FC Arsenal. Um, and this is the match analysis suite, which gives um, the players the ability to relive moments of a past game. Obviously, we need the tracking data, so um, it, it only goes for the elite teams. Um, but relive moments in order to see what they've, what they've done wrong, um, in order to, to learn from their mistakes, um, or actually to see something good again. Um, and the interesting part about this is that um, this has actually benefited not, not only and actually not as much to the elite players in, in the clubs, but it has mainly benefited the academy players because these kids that are you know, 10 to 16 years old do not have the ability to, to, to be on a pitch you know, playing with professional other football players. And for them to be able to go into the VR headset and relive moments from, from obviously some of the elite players in the, in the club, uh, see, the, see the, how, how fast they see the pace of the game and then make decisions on that. Um, we've then partnered with the University of Utrecht to run an analysis so that it's all uh, we see scientific um, and some of these decision making uh, processes have then actually gained one to two seconds which in, in elite football is is a lot being able to to make quick decisions um, so that's great and so this is being used by clubs um, today um, once this was being developed it also kind of then turned into what else can we do right and we have this technology uh, where else can we go into and then it kind of went into the the realm of the broadcasting aspect um, with these virtual cameramen and also be able to fly around uh, like in a, in a rig like this um, onto the pitch while the game was happening. Um, and then you might have seen scenes like these uh, where Jamie Carragher um, is analyzing a, a game from the weekend together at, um, yeah, with, uh, I forgot his name now. Uh, this is, uh, I'll get to it later. Um, and uh, yeah, on Monday Night Football, um, basically putting on the headsets and going through the scenes, explaining it from a, an attacker's perspective or a, a defender's perspective and just dissecting that scene um, that much more. The second part is more about data enhancement. And here we actually work together with uh, leagues um, and also data tracking providers in order to help them with making the right choice when it comes to who they actually partner with. And this is an example that we did for the MLS in the US where we were able to visualize the data that was coming in live um, right away and um, obviously this is usually a video but it's better in stills and you can see here that on the bottom right part which is kind of the produced version of the data which you takes three to five minutes to come in later versus the live data you do see some differences for example the ball is in a different place and obviously it's very very important to have accurate data in order to run all of those simulations and um, so we work with these um, data tracking providers and the leagues in order to make the right decisions more as a consultant and show them what they should go for. And this is how it looks like. Uh, I couldn't really tell what it is, but it looks nice, has lots of dots and shows that there's errors. But basically this is what the data scientists uh, with all their PhD here is, uh, are doing. Um, the interesting part and where it gets a bit more into um, a tangible aspect also for us as fans is, is the, next, uh, the next things. Also, you know, what, what can we do with this technology to, to touch more than just the B2B aspect? Uh, and why actually do we want to do this? Here we've done a test, or well, actually not a test, we've done a live integration of the AFC um, championship uh, final um, in, in American football earlier this year in January and streamed this on Twitch. 
um, we used a completely new environment because being in VR, we can actually do, or like in a virtual simulation, we can recreate any environment as we see fit. It's kind of Minecraft D blocky characters. And uh, we've streamed this on Twitch uh, with an NFL player um, and, and, a, and a Twitch streamer to an audience, which was actually five times higher than the audience of the live game here in the Netherlands. Um, so that's great. And it was geoblocked in the Netherlands. So it's shown us that there's a whole generation out there of sports fans, which might not like the actual sport in itself, but are open for something like this. Uh, we call them Gen Z, I believe. Um, and this is, this is where it's great. Constantine, I'm going to respectfully ask you to wrap up a little bit so we can ask some questions and make sure everyone gets to ask you how long it took you to do the partnerships with the arenas and the leagues and all of that. So we're going to jump to Jeff if you can just wrap up. Absolutely. Uh, there's a couple of more examples, but I'm happy to go into those later. We can do fun stuff like this where players fly into <laughs> the air. Uh, we can recreate scenes looking more at uh, yeah, 300 because it's virtual in order to apply or like make it more appealing to a younger audience. And the main important aspect is we want this to get into the hands of the fans to be able to do the same things, zooming in, zooming out, being able to see new content of, of past games and also have fun with it, apply filters, um, use uh, Lego filters uh, for them to play with um, so that then in the end they have an experience that they can actually create clips themselves and then share them uh, with others. That's it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So we've all seen how they started off from the B2B space working on um, the, the, the team and the player side and then how they've translated that and scaled that to the fan side. Love to introduce Jeff from Neurotrainer and he can explain how they were really early to the market and uh, how they're going to keep up with uh, the world that we are living in today. So Jeff, to you. Great. Thank you. Nice to meet everybody. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that? Excellent. Okay, so my name is Jeff Nyquist. I'm the founder and chief scientist at Neurotrainer. Uh, my background in training is in cognitive neuroscience. I was trained at Vanderbilt University and uh, we spent about 10 years exploring neuroplasticity um, in more health related activities. Um, We've published research showing improvements in recovering vision for visually impaired populations. We have exciting results for dementia, uh, concussion recovery, ADHD. Um, but as a company proper, uh, we are a product devoted to the idea of athletic development. So what we're talking about here is mostly the cognitive side of athletic skills. Uh, great athletes have always displayed wonderful abilities uh, between the ears, quote unquote, with, um, you know, for example, Steph Curry is in an environment of basketball where there really isn't right and wrong decisions. There's good, better, best decisions. And he and many of the elite players have an uncanny ability to see the great decision quicker. Uh, athletes talk about being able to slow the game down and literally see the stitches on a baseball as it's being pitched at them. Um, we have great performances by great soccer players who seem to be able to have eyes in the back of their head and be uh, at their best even when it's the most pressure situations. These are more cognitive abilities. Uh, they're certainly a blending of physical and cognitive, but Neurotrainer is uh, kind of cracking open the black box of the athlete's uh, mental skills and addressing these. The issue up until now is that most athletes don't get access to a great sports scientist or a sports psychologist or an IMG academy. Neurotrainer allows the ability to have um, world-class neuroscience and, and training skills inside these VR headsets where you can train from anywhere. And so what we're talking about is really steeped in rigorous cognitive neuroscience, which includes vision, it includes um, focus, it, it includes the ability to get into a flow state more frequently than the other guy or the other gal and have effortless perfection of performance. Um, these are skills that are becoming more well understood primarily through fMRI studies of brain imaging where we, we know what tasks light up what networks of the brain and therefore we can develop those tasks to pinpoint and activate those networks in the brain that are responsible 
for those specific abilities. And just like any athlete that focuses on practice and getting into the gym, these are repetitions that practice makes more perfect. So very briefly, the, the product is uh, currently on the Oculus Quest. That is the best in class piece of hardware. Um, our enterprise teams like the mobility and the ease of use. Um, it can be used anywhere. Uh, it's designed to meet the athlete where they're at. Uh, so we adjust in real time every, well, every eight seconds or so to the athlete's ability so that it's always pushing them but not overly frustrating them. And one key aspect is that it's fun. Um, they're actually in there competing against each other, which we, we kind of differentiate from many products that sit on a shelf. Uh, uh, the guys and girls will put the headset back on simply to get back in there and beat their colleagues. Underneath the hood, we have a team of engineers that have spent uh, the lion's share of two and a half years developing the infrastructure to collect uh, a plethora of data. And so this is specifically around the behaviors of the athlete that indicate the cognitive abilities. Uh, most cognitive neuroscience, unless you're in a MRI tube, is behaviorally based measurements. Um, we also include the physicality of the athlete, and then we include the actual physical environment that they're interacting with. And so you bring these three together and you kind of get the full stack picture of the athlete's performance, what's going on between their um, ears, what's going on in their environment in, in the moment, and how they're interacting with it with their body. And so what this uncovers is new insights, such as how does your hand-eye coordination look when you're cognitively loaded with a pressure situation? Um, are, you, are you flat and don't show any degradation? Or do you seem to uh, fall under pressure and really have an issue with hand-eye coordination? Uh, there's a variety of ways that we can start to measure the differences across athletes and how they, their performance changes depending on the cognitive demands that they're placed under. Jeff, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to wrap up. Okay, that's perfect. So we, we place ourselves uh, not in the strength and conditioning side of, of the market, but more in the, the side of the mental and the skill aspect. And so we, we kind of blend some of the uh, values of meditation apps, um, cognitive measurement apps, and some of these VR simulation apps. And together we're distilling athletic skill training along with neuroscience simultaneously. And I can end right there. And this is our, our world-class team that's putting it all together. Wonderful. Thank you so much. What, what I'd love for everyone to think about and I'd love for you to answer when we jump to some questions. Hopefully we have time is you gave some examples of a lot of ball sports uh, coming going into the Olympics. Obviously, there are multiple different um, verticals of people's athleticism. So it'll be interesting to know how these skills, A, apply across um, the broad spectrum of, of categories. Surfing's now in the Olympics, so how are you going to do that? And then also um, with the changes in hardware, uh, just curious how you factor in any margin of error if you saw for a baseline or something like that. So things to think about. Hopefully we'll have time. Um, now we're going to jump to Dylan Shaw at YUR. And I think, Dylan, if uh, something I think you can address is specifically how people have changed with their habits of working out in this COVID environment. So... Um, because you are more consumer facing uh, as compared to coming in from the B2B side, even though I know you have a B2B strategy, it would be great for you to touch upon what you've seen in terms of usage or how people, ha um, and anecdotally what you've seen people do to accommodate this new, new normal, as we say. So I will leave it to you. Sure, sure. Thank you, Jenna. Um, a lot of really interesting insights from both Jeff and Constantine. Um, really, really uh, proud to be joining you today because there's so much relevant sort of intersection among our three companies. Um, so my talk's called Movement Goes Immersive and I'm co-founder and chief product officer at YUR and we make games a workout. And so basically we have 100,000 plus consumers using our product in market right now. 
uh, essentially kind of the market's le leading solution for quantifying your movement data on the virtual reality side, um, expanding out into AR. Um, so this is about the closest I've ever been to the Netherlands. Uh, this is the Dutch windmill in San Francisco uh, down there after a bike ride. So I just thought I'd throw that in there. Uh, I did travel the world extensively uh, with my previous company, Virtually Live, which is not dissimilar to Beyond Sports. So I really want to cover sports media and VR from more of a macro perspective before getting into the nitty gritty of what we're discovering here at YUR and my current work experience. So this is a snapshot of uh, the, my previous company. Uh, I think one of the really salient details to note is that what you're seeing here is a virtual recreation, not dissimilar again to what Beyond Sports is doing, uh, of a real sporting event. And through our trials and tribulations at Virtually Live, um, you know, you realize that it's very difficult to have FIFA level quality graphics of a human character. You know, doing this sort of real time computer graphic simulation of a sporting event, it opens up the new uh, sort of fan engagement that you are looking for uh, as a broadcaster, as a sports organization, as a club, where the user gets to go in and choose where they watch the event from, but there are trade offs, right? And so, even still, even with the cutting edge virtual reality systems like the Quest, you're going to come up against detail um, kind of challenges. And so, this is an overview of the Virtual Be Live process. Again, there are other providers in the market. So like some of the other virtually live uh, sort of uh, ecosystem, uh, beyond sports ecosystem, uh, some of which have found uh, acquirers, uh, Intel and Apple, both interested in debatably the more, more of the digital rights side of things here. Uh, but everyone here kind of using some sort of, uh, sort of media fusion to give the fan a real time cutting edge technology experience where they can choose where to engage the sport. Um, and a note about my discoveries is working as the global evangelist at this previous company was just that, you know, sensor technology is constantly evolving. There are many catalysts for that technology. Uh, here is just a brief overview of some of the sports technology tracking providers that you can go to and get like an out of the box solution. Um, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel and you can focus on the aspect that you're really trying to solve for, for your organization. Uh, at, at Virtually Live, we partnered with Stats for the soccer product, and then we moved over to Formula E eventually because that solved many of the challenges. Um, but, you know, even still with Formula E, I was seeing that the cars were kind of moving and jumping all over the place. Um, you know, I, I've given thousands of demos, and the thing is, people were always blown away by that product, but they never converted to real users just because of the high barrier to entry for virtual reality as a technology. And then finally, like live sports digital rights is a conundrum for VR because you don't know if you need to carve that out of the live sports that have already or live live rights that have already been sold as a digital package, right? So let's get into like more of why I transitioned to why you are and where we are today as an economy. Uh, we're seeing a clandestine move towards tracking everything: the, the amount of minutes you're you're spending standing a day, you know, your sleep quality. Um, everybody is on the latest and greatest uh, with Apple Health or you know Samsung Fit, uh, Samsung Health or Google Fit, uh, and these data stores are giving healthcare providers a better snapshot of how you live outside of the clinic. Um, and so, around the time I was working at my last company, I realized, and you know Jenna has experience with this, Beat Saber, which has sold fifty million dollars worth of VR content at this point, um, you know, is it really active? Video game. For those of you who are on the call who aren't familiar with Beat Saber, it's the number one best selling game. And similar to sport, you're distracted by how fun it is, but you're getting a workout in, you know, and its biomechanics may not be perfect from a, you know, from a strength and conditioning standpoint. But the important part is you suddenly got this new population of people who hadn't really engaged in fitness suddenly coming online, right? So why is that? And, you know, like you kind of look at it and where, where the market is right now. And you realize like with shelter in place, people do have that mental barrier um, if you're not an athlete at the highest levels, just to get up and get engaged, get going. Um, and that rate of perceived exertion is proven to be much lower in a virtual environment that's more immersive, right? Um, and so why you are right now combines gaming and fitness um, by building a world-class um, 
you know, interface inside of any game. So over 9,000 games and applications have been tagged to date. Um, you know, over 100,000 consumers using the product. And what you can see here is that we're trying to blend the, the, the interface of the future. What I mean by that is we're using skeuomorphic design to showcase you know, your calories, your stats, you know, how many squats you're doing in a, in a space, all at your wrist, which is already the comfortable, more, more comfortable kind of interface for those data, data metrics in the real world. Um, and then on the B2B side, we're actually licensing this technology to Fortune 50 companies. And how do we do this, right? So basically we have this leading community of users that's willing to, um, you, know, in, you know, kind of provide us with their base heart rate monitor data. Um, and we, we run our own machine learning against the acceler acceleration and velocity values coming out of these IMUs um, uh, that you can find in most of these virtual reality headsets on the market. We do that all behind the scenes and then present to the user their calories burned, uh, their estimated heart rate, squats, other movements that they're doing. And you can see here um, in terms of Jenna's initial ask, like steady usage increased right the way through February and March when COVID kicked off. Um, and I think the reason why it's kind of more anti-fragile to the sort of coronavirus, if you will, is just because it's plainly speaking something you can do in a living room, right? So uh, with that, I'd like to close and you know transition the floor back over to Jenna. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you to all three of you. Um, I have a couple quick follow-up questions, and if anyone in the community tuning in has any, please feel free to pose those. I'm going to go back to Constantine. Uh, Dylan brought up the myriad of issues of rights. So looking at the Olympics, um, can there be one official VR streaming partner if you were to become the official partner of uh, whoever holds the broadcast rights? And do you have to then have a separate agreement uh, I think the next session after us is about uh, smart arenas, uh, sustainable arenas and things of that nature. So my question to you, Constantine, is do you need to do rights with the actual physical arena, the team and the broadcaster? How quickly, how, do, how does that um, structure work if you were to go in and want to approach um, everybody, all the stakeholders involved in the Olympics? It's the wonderful answer to most of these questions. It's, it depends, and especially <laughs> at the moment, it's, it is, as you said, it's in, in the, the slides are very well. It's, it's a very gray area at the moment, but I believe if we talk about the Olympics, um, you know, which are a, no, like it's a few more years from now, obviously, um, we, there will be more clarity. At the moment, everybody's trying to figure out um, how these rights are being sold and, and what you can do with them and what the monetization is behind them, especially. Also because uh, given the circumstances, uh, a lot of um, yeah, media rights holders believe that the, the money that will go over the table for the live pictures actually will go down or at least stay stable. They won't see the same growth that they've seen them in the past couple of years, especially for, for these big properties such as the Premier League. Um, so it'll be, it'll be an interesting subject. Uh, we basically, there's all the constructs currently. I mean, they exist, every, like we work with UEFA on rights, we work with the direct broadcaster for rights. We work with, um, with the leagues for the rights. We don't really work with stadiums, so that's, that will be new. Um, and then we work with you with the, with the data tracking providers, which have the cameras installed, uh, the Kyrenegos, the second spectrums of the world, um, that are collecting that data and then selling them. So uh, it's, it's all of the above, basically, but I believe that there'll be some, um, uh, yeah, some, some time to make, a, make it clear and have a good change. That's great. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it, is, it is such a fun, navigational process when you're dealing with media rights and team rights and arena rights. It's a, it's a world I, I live in every day as well. Um, and even if you talk to sponsors, there might be some opportunities there with sponsors to do something sort of independent and circling the event, which is something important to think about. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to go back, I want to go to the neurotrainer team. Uh, I don't know who's joined us uh, from there, if, if Jeff is alone or if, if others have joined him. But going back okay, to the question here. that I had, <laughs> wonderful, welcome. I'm um, going back to the question that I briefly had, and we have about uh, two, three minutes left for everything, I think. Um, how would you go about, what are those partnerships for you? If you were to go to, you know, use the platform that is the Olympics, would you reach out to specific athletes, teams, a specific category of, of sport? I'm just curious as to what your sweet spot is and, and what you would be looking to optimize your tech for looking at the Olympics. Yeah, so I'll take a quick crack at it, and then Dave, please feel free. I can answer that too, yeah. Yeah, so uh, at a high level, 
up, up until now, we've been an enterprise company selling directly to professional and elite organizations, sports organizations. Uh, we are planning on launching a consumer version early next year, uh, but our, our sweet spot and our skill set currently is about deploying headsets, onboarding, training, training the trainers, and getting an organization up and uh, comfortable with our product. And usually uh, several hours, we'll, we'll fly to the location and get everyone onboarded. Um, and so in terms of the sports that we feel comfortable with, you know, the, the sky's the limit uh, in terms of, you know, we're not trying to give specific sports simulations. Mm -hmm. we're, distilling, we're distilling down the experience to be challenging athletically and cognitively. So if you are in a sport where it's important to stay poised under pressure and focus, if it's important for you to have awareness of your surroundings and peripheral vision, you know, this applies to a lot of different sports. And there's a variety of ways that we can improve the athletic skills for different sports. Have you seen the uptick as well, like Dylan has shown in his graph, uh, as to people wanting to adopt your services during, during COVID, now that they've been training at home or however, you know, if they're at the NBA down at Disney World, curious, <laughs> have you seen differences in adoption of your product or, or interest? Yeah, at the enterprise level, it's definitely went on pause immediately and slowed down, but the direct to athlete from those sports organizations uh, drastically increased. And so we were one of the few ways to stay sharp from home. You know, Steph Curry had to buy a basketball court and install it at his house because he didn't have one. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's a, a surprising level of limitations that these athletes were running into from home and we were able to fill that void pretty quickly. Wonderful. Um, Dylan, I'm gonna jump to you so we get a question in for you. Looking again towards the Olympics, you guys are a platform play. You don't have your own uh, experiences or proprietary experiences, if you will. What do you think you can encourage a developer to create sort of like train with the training regimens of X athletes and then apply it to do that? What do you think the applications might be for your product with, with the Olympics? What are some of the touch points for fans uh, to tie in? Well, who would you look to partner with to create an experience um, knowing all the folks we've talked about, broadcasters, stadiums, fans, leagues, athletes themselves, curious how you, why you are would optimize the, the momentum towards the Olympics. Yeah, it's a super interesting question. I mean, I think that it can be tackled in a number of different ways. Um, assuming that the Olympics is kind of in a post COVID era where being in person is fine and like you know the the stadium has opened back up or or you know the venue is a is a crowded venue um there's a whole lot that you can do with um you can still do with at event activations um i you know i can see on the software side um many challenges for fan engagement uh you know showing the fan how many calories they burned or so forth and i think that you know eight years out is a very difficult uh, kind mm -hmm. of thing to, to talk about but i think that what you're seeing right now is Certainly, um, people are getting much more comfortable with um, recording themselves, uh, you know, live chats alongside. I don't know. So I think one interesting thing to share with this group that has nothing to do with sports is a phenomenon known as Netflix party, right? So shelter in place, you all have Netflix subscriptions and you just click on this Chrome plugin and it gives you a chat bar, not dissimilar to this one on Zoom right now. And then you're concurrently watching, you're able to chat, right? Lightweight features that people are using today um, are kind of like where my head is as a product person. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think YUR continued to expand on sort of the biometric um, inference and, and, and sort of finding uh, the athletic value that, that can be um, unearthed from, from data. Um, but, you know, that's a very interesting question. I just don't. You can't. You can't tell the future eight years from now. I'm. I'm very disappointed in you, young man. Uh, <laughs> um, but no, to your, to your point, I think for everybody on the on the panel, you know, when you ask the consumer what they want, they're going to say things that they are accustomed to and used to, and they're going to compare things to Netflix and the interactive features that they are used to. Um, it's going to be a very interesting decision on all of your parts as to what. What are those interactive features for the consumer? Because remember, you know, there are passive folks who just want to watch a stream. 
There are folks who are leaning forward, and then there are people who are falling off their chairs, hungering for interactivity. And this is a whole new platform that everyone here has to remember. Um, there are new formats. It's a new way of engaging, and we don't even know what those formats are going to be or what those interactive touch points are going to be. So I think that the suite of offerings, not only to the athlete, because they've been training and having sensors put on them from Nike and their labs and other places. We don't know what they're gonna be testing now. And then from the consumer side, we don't know what those interactive features are that are gonna be the most compelling. It may not be photorealistic imagery. It may be simulations that are very stylized. They may wanna have a Netflix party and watch. They may just wanna do fantasy sports and esports and bet on these folks, which is also who knows what's gonna happen in eight years. But yeah. Uh, on that, yeah, so if anyone has any final thoughts, I think we're going to wrap up in the next uh, 30 seconds or so and move on to the next amazing session. But any, any closing thoughts, Dylan? You look very poised to, to I, do, I, I <laughs> wanted to also share one thing that was really unique about Formula E, um, Formula Electric, right, that, that electric racing championship, mm -hmm. was they were on the bleeding edge of doing something around fan engagement where your your average viewer could actually vote for a driver to get a boost in the middle of the race mm -hmm. right and i think you're going to see that trend continue and expand expand and broaden across other sports where you get that ability to impact what's happening live so but that I just crowds know. yeah the crowdsourcing or helping the decision making um and it might even impact the actual data that you know jeff and team collect as to oh hey i've learned right. this or or, you know, Constantine's figured this out because they've looked at the playbooks, the athletes there, but at the same time, what does the fan want and how much does that play into the theater of it all? So there, there's so many different ways to look at it. Um, but gentlemen, um, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you everybody who's tuned in. There's so many different touch points and, and inputs that we can all discuss. Um, I think we will share um, I'm hope, hoping the, the team from the consulate will share everyone's contact information. But uh, thank you so much. And uh, just um, look at it. Always look at this Jenna, amazing space. Yes. If I may, I'd like uh -huh. to also thank you on behalf oh. of the consulates for putting together <laughs> the session together with us for the really thorough introduction for um, and also all of the speakers for the demos, for your uh, perspectives on what's next and what you're working on right now. I'm sure there will be a lot of opportunity for follow-up in the months to come. And I'm personally really looking forward to that. So I also wanted to take the opportunity to thank you. And now I'll leave the closing word to you again. Yep, I think, I think you wrapped it up nicely. Thank you everyone for joining. Enjoy the entire mission for the next few days and um, stay well, everyone. Cheers, thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you.